hopefully this thing works. <laughs> yeah, yes, we're recording on iCloud as well. Yep. Okay. Hopefully this thing works. <laughs> All right, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. Uh, as you know, Health for the World is a nonprofit organization based in California, promoting health worldwide using education, technology solutions, and humanitarian assistance for COVID-19 in 122 countries. Uh, I am Bhavya Rihani, co-founder and uh, president of Health for the World. We have our co-founders, Dr. Bill Dillon and Dr. Ankur Parija here, and our grand round speaker, Dr. Uh, Peter Chen Hong um, and Venkat from our team. Uh, I have worked with many of you uh, in the last few years and you have inspired, be, inspired me by the resilience uh, shown during COVID-19. Now, uh, all of us are dealing with another surge with the Omicron. Um, our aim is to disseminate reliable information and we have um, multiple series of uh, webinars focused on Omicron. Uh, the, this is the first one um, by Peter. We have one more on January 21st, which is based uh, on pediatric manifestations of Omicron by Dr. Mark Foka from Montefiore Albert Einstein University, New York. And then we have a panel from South Africa, uh, which is tentatively planned on January 28th. Uh, as always, please feel free to enter your name, the country where you're from, and any questions in the Q&A box. Peter has a talk for around 10 minutes, so we do have um, you know, a good, good amount of time today for Q&A. Um, I'll start with Peter's introduction without uh, further uh, delay. We, uh, we are really honored to have Dr. Peter Chin Hong, who is a professor uh, of School of Medicine at UCSF. He's the Associate Dean for Regional Campuses. He's a medical educator who specializes in treating infectious diseases, particularly that develop in patients who have suppressed immune systems. Uh, he, di he directs the immunocompromised host infectious disease program at UCSF. Uh, Peter earned his undergraduate and medical degree from Brown University. He completed his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSF. He has received numerous prestigious teaching awards from UCSF. Thank you so much, Peter, for doing this talk for us. And uh, whenever you're ready, you can start the talk. Thanks so much, Bavia. Uh, let me just share screen now. And um, hopefully we can all get on the same page. So part of the reason for me to give the first uh, part of this talk as more formal is that we can all get on the same page. And a lot of this data is emerging. I would say the best data so far comes from South Africa still. Um, and then the UK, and then we haven't had a lot of data from the US, but hopefully that's emerging. And hopefully these data from these countries will then shape how we would think about Omicron as it really goes around the world. And I really think that it will envelop the world. There's not as much in Asia and other parts of the world yet, but um, it's only a matter of time. So I'm going to start with really five questions, um, which is uh, how is Omicron variant different from the other variants? Uh, is it more contagious? I think we can answer that question already. Uh, do vaccines work? Do you get sicker from Omicron? And do our current treatments uh, for COVID work? So let's think about how it's different. So it's really different because it has a lot of mutations. Um, and if you think about the number of mutations in Omicron, it's about 50 and Delta is less than 20. And most concerningly, many of these mutations are in the spike protein. And why is that important? It's important because the vaccines that we have deliver the message to look like the spike protein in the regular variant. So when the antibodies develop against the vaccine spike protein, when the spike protein looks so mutated and different uh, and twisted like in Omicron, these antibodies that develop against the regular spike protein from the vaccines may not work as well to sort of capture and neutralize the enemy. So that's the reason why we're fearful about it because it's more vaccine invasive because of these mutations here. And 10 of these mutations are on the business end of the spike protein, which is what where the spike protein attaches to enter the body through the ACE2 receptors. So if that's stickier or holds on like a bulldog, uh, that will also increase the transmissibility. 
So is it more contagious? Well, let's think about Delta. We know a lot more about Delta. Delta is thought to be 200% more transmissible than the original Wuhan strain. So this is Delta up here. And you can see that some of the other variants like Gamma from Brazil, Alpha from the UK and Beta from South Africa, they, until Omicron, uh, Delta was really way beyond that in terms of transmissibility. And because of that, uh, Delta really took over the world. And we're seeing that happening with Omicron now. So from original estimates, uh, Omicron is thought to be about uh, four times or five times as transmissible as Delta. So you're talking about many, many hundred percent fold increase. So sticking with Delta, just to give you an idea of how it compares to other infections we normally know, uh, the original version of coronavirus um, was here, meaning one person or the R0 can affect about maybe three people uh, who are unvaccinated. And then when you think about Delta, that's close to chickenpox, which is around seven or so. And then when you think about Omicron, it's closer to measles. So in a normal situation, one person who's infected can infect as many as 15 people. And part of it is the way that we think uh, the infection occurs. So in the old days, you know, like uh, influenza or many other respiratory viruses, these viruses travel in droplets, which are really heavy, and they drop uh, before six feet. But what's happening with variants like Delta and then now Omicron is that the droplets are so fine, they're like little dandelions and they go into the air. And we think that they linger in the air because they're so light uh, for much longer. So in measles, somebody with measles can be in a room, uh, leave the room, and you can come into that room two to three hours later and get measles. And that's because these virus-laden uh, aerosols, we call them very fine droplets, linger in the air, and uh, you can come in uh, and get it even after the patient is gone. And, and that's what we think might be happening with Omicron as well, although it's not really uh, proven uh, conclusively as yet. So we do know that Omicron rapidly eclipsed Delta in South Africa. And if you see the waves of infection in South Africa, um, you have the original variant, and then you have beta the variant first described in South Africa. And then you have uh, Delta, and you can see the Delta slope increase and then decrease is um, over a much wider period. So like maybe around three months. And it's estimated that, you know, more than 50% of those in South Africa, 70% in some areas, 80% have been exposed naturally to Delta, given how severe that uh, surge was in South Africa recently. But nevertheless, uh, when we see the rate of increase, it's really breathtaking for Omicron. So in red, it's Omicron. Uh, in blue, it's Delta. And B, uh, green, it's Beta. So what it means is it's not only uh, taking over the landscape because it's transmissible. It's doing it in a really, really rapid fashion. And that's because, it again, it it's really speaks to how transmissible it is and how previous uh, infection with other variants uh, like uh, beta, uh, Delta in South Africa didn't really protect against uh, getting infection against Omicron, mainly because again, the spike protein looks so different in Omicron. So the way to think about the rate of increase is, you know, like a vertical wall as some people described it, or it's like a car. So maybe uh, Omicron is like a Maserati or, a a Porsche and you really press in, they accelerate and it goes up really fast. Delta might be like a good, um, you know, maybe Lexus. And then beta is kind of like a uh, uh, Prius or to your, Pri uh, you know, um, uh, Prius in terms of that rate of increase, which is really uh, much slower. So not only is the rate of increase up steep, but we also luckily the silver lining is the rate of descent is also going to be steep, we think. And in South Africa, um, the infection is, is really going down very quickly. So we're hoping that's what happens in the rest of the world as well. So do vaccines work? Well, I think now you kind of know the answer uh, to that just because the spike protein looks so different. But it depends on what your goalpost is. If you think about, I want to distinguish that many in the audience know between getting infection, like I can get infected, with a virus, but I don't necessarily have to get very sick and disease, which is I'm getting really sick. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to the ICU. So 
when you think about uh, antibodies, that's only part of the picture. When you look at many studies uh, before with antibodies against alpha, uh, delta, uh, beta variants, it always looks like it's worse uh, because they have more mutations. So the spike protein looks slightly different. But when you look at the outcomes we care most about, which is serious disease, hospitalization, and death, um, you can see that many of the other variants, even Delta, uh, still the vaccine still retain power against these outcomes that the, we fear about the most. But you, in the old days, you can probably get away with one dose. And then with Delta, you need two doses. And with Omicron, it seems that you need a, a booster with three doses. And three doses might be the sweet spot. Sure, people are talking about uh, fourth dose, a fifth dose, et cetera. But it just depends on what you want to prevent. If you want to prevent serious disease, maybe three doses might be, again, the optimal because we use three doses in many other vaccines like hepatitis B, uh, human papillomavirus, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. And the reason why is that you do a priming with one, two early on, a few months later, you remind the immune system. And then that seems to lead to very durable or long lasting uh, inside immunity, which is T cells and B cells. But it just depends on what you want to prevent. If you want to prevent serious disease, maybe three doses might be, again, the optimal because we use. Uh, so do vaccines work? I think yes, uh, as an infectious disease doctor, they work against the outcomes we care most about, especially if you are boosted. So the pros are, it prevents serious disease, uh, history repeats itself, like it should you the data with Delta and some of the other variants. People were afraid that you weren't preventing infection, but we saw that it was really keeping people away from the hospital. Antibodies are only part of the picture and memory B cells and T cells can adapt to variants that's the adaptive immunity. So no, no matter what variant you get, that original vaccine will help uh, modify its, these T cells and B cells to help make uh, a, a great response against the new variant. So the way I think about it is like you have a house and you're trying to keep your house safe, which is your body, and you have a gate to the house that comes in before the house. So the enemy can get inside the gate because maybe the guards are falling asleep. But once they try to get inside your house, uh, you're, you have a really great uh, bulldog or guard dog, and it's going to kick the enemy outside no matter what. And these, uh, that bulldog or that guard dog is going to stay intact, and that's really what the intent of the vaccines is for. Sure, we can use it to prevent um, the enemy from getting in the front gate with antibodies, but those always wane over time. So the most important thing to preserve hospital capacity is really the, preventing uh, that serious disease, hospitalization, and death. So the cons are, of course, it doesn't prevent all infection. And that is a big deal because uh, so many people are getting infected right now with Omicron that it's impacting workforce in all spheres, government services, restaurants, Broadway shows, theaters, um, and most importantly, healthcare. As many um, nurses, laboratory technicians, uh, physicians, uh, other uh, technical staff are being called away to, uh, be, oh, put into isolation because they have gotten this very, very transmissible variant. We also know that uh, natural immunity, at least from Delta, doesn't protect you against Omicron. But when you get Omicron, it protects you against Delta. And we've seen that data most recently from South Africa. So what, what is in the future? Well, we can continue to talk about that in Q&A. But um, if we needed to customize a vaccine for mRNA, Pfizer says that they can adapt the vaccine in six weeks, ship it in about three months. And Moderna says, you know, they need about two months to adapt their vaccine if we really need to change the recipe or change the formula. Um, so where do we stand now in terms of vaccine efficacy? Well, if you got two doses of vaccine, probably prevents about 20%. The efficacy is only about 20% against uh, Omicron for infection. If you got a booster recently, it's, it goes up to maybe about uh, 70%. But when you look at the prevention, serious disease, um, two doses, about 65% uh, of Omicron for hospitalization, uh, a booster will give you up to 90%. But my feeling is that uh, a lot of people coming into the hospital with a mixture of two things. They have um, 
people who have real COVID, but also people are coming for other reasons and happen to get diagnosed with COVID because we are checking everyone as they come into the hospital. So it's probably about 70%, 60 to 70% real COVID and about 30 to 40% of incidental COVID. Um, so at the end of the day, probably the vaccines will even be more spectacular against death, protection against death, which uh, we don't have the best data for, but uh, that's my feeling as well. Even though hospitalization seem, you know, 65% with two doses, um, you know, 90% with a booster, but probably with two doses, you can prevent uh, a really high proportion of deaths. So this is just some data from uh, science uh, from a few months ago showing that even though antibodies um, can wane very dramatically over time against various variants, the memory T cells and B cells remain relatively um, you know, intact. So do you get sicker with Omicron? Uh, so far, so good. In South Africa, from the earliest reports, we knew that uh, people weren't seeming to be too sick. They had one to two days of severe fatigue, body aches, flu-like symptoms. What was interesting, there was no shortness of breath uh, or very little, no loss of taste and smell like Delta and the other variants. Vaccinated people had even fewer symptoms as we would expect. And um, then people said, well, South Africa is not like the rest of the world. And we were really fearful about when it comes uh, into the other parts of the world because South Africa has a high proportion of folks who are exposed to natural infection, and maybe that kept it uh, lower, and also their population is younger than other parts of the world. But it seems that this, this playbook is the same in other parts of the world. We first got data from Europe showing that from their CDC, that of their first set of cases where they swabbed everyone, about 50% were asymptomatic and 50% were mild symptoms, but their vaccination rate is about 70% on average, depending on the country. And so far in the US, uh, again, it's showing to be in general mild for most people who get it. Uh, most people are at home isolating or have no symptoms. Um, but because so many people are infected, even a small proportion of those people going to the hospital, of a large number of people going to the hospital, is increasing our hospitalization. So right now, you know, we're probably, you know, I would say about five times where we were at the end of. November, but we started off at a really low level, but about half of the amount as one year ago with the pre-vaccination surge. How do people present? I think we have a lot of information now, um, or more information, just from my personal experience and from as it moves around the world. Uh, your typical person um, uh, who is vaccinated, even with two doses, uh, would present with very mild symptoms. Um, scratchy throat seems to be very common. Uh, congestion, runny nose, and but no loss of uh, smell or taste, um, and some muscle aches, very small proportion of people have fever, and less uh, shortness of breath. Uh, and when we look at data from Hong Kong and other countries, they show that biologically what's happening is that there's a lot of virus uh, production happening in the big areas, like the bronchus, but not a lot in the meat of the lung, the parenchyma of the lung. Um, and that's because there's probably this protein um, that seems to be not as sticky to the virus once it gets in, and that's preventing it from causing a lot of lung infection. But there's so much virus in the big bronchus, 70 times more than um, Delta, which itself was much more transmissible than the other variants. So that's why it's so uh, transmissible and may also help us understand why uh, diagnostics uh, may not pick it up if you're swabbing your nose as early as uh, maybe thinking about the future using throat or, or saliva samples. People have also been presenting with back pain as well, which is kind of an interesting um, uh, symptom. So, you know, in, in terms of the South African data, um, they were the first to show really that uh, they were seeing a smaller proportion of cases come into the hospital. So to give you some idea, with Delta, it's about 15% of people who are infected end up going to the hospital. With Omicron, it's thought to be about 5%, but 5% of a big number is still numerically a lot of people compared to even 15% of a smaller number of people who are infected. So do our current treatments work? Well, um, 
Generally, yes. I mean, remdesivir still works, steroids still work, uh, some of the other anti-inflammatories still work. But what doesn't work is monoclonal antibodies, because again, if you develop an antibody in a factory against the spike protein you know about, it's not going to really fit as easily. So they're not able to neutralize or prevent uh, the trans the production of viruses. But the silver lining is that the pills that are going to be more widespread around the world very, very soon, um, Molupiravir from Merck, Paxlovid from Pfizer are really spike protein independent because they work on the virus factory itself, which is from Molupiravir from Merck, it works by inserting genetic uh, errors in the as the virus makes more of itself. And from the Pfizer Paxlovid, it works as a protease inhibitor, many of you know about many protease inhibitors in HIV and hepatitis C, it's the same idea. As the virus uh, packages itself for export from the cell, it inhibits that enzyme that's nicely tying up the, the virus in the package. So it's kind of like a bad post office uh, helper uh, who can't tape your box so the virus can't uh, really look really nice and neat as it gets exported. And that's why the protease inhibitors work. Um, Molupiravir, 30% uh, effective at preventing hospitalization um, within five days, uh, four, four pills twice a day. Uh, the side effect, really well, very well tolerated, only about 1% of people uh, stop taking the meds in clinical trials, um, but uh, it, it's a teratogen. So pe uh, pregnant persons, uh, contraindicated, uh, people thinking about having babies uh, within for the four, you know, the few days of taking and four days after of uh, molnupiravir uh, can't take it because of the these genetic mutations that might occur. And for children uh, under the age of 12, uh, not, not great. Um, because of that, again, um, anything growing, uh, rapidly dividing like bones and, and cartilage and things like that, we worry about. For Paxlovid, I really think that's going to uh, change a lot of things around the world. Three pills twice a day. The only issue is uh, drug interactions uh, with blood thinners like Coumadin, some antibiotics, uh, et cetera, some statins that people have to worry about. But three pills twice a day for five days, take it within three days, prevents 89% of hospitalizations in unvaccinated. Take within five days, prevents... Uh, 88% of hospitalizations, even better than monoclonal antibodies and much easier to give. Merck and Pfizer have already uh, gotten into voluntary licensing agreements uh, with many companies around the world and also talked about tiered pricing. It's easier to manufacture pills than vaccines, although vaccines is going to be by far the number one, two, and three solutions overall. But in the meantime, I think these pills will have a benefit in slowing things down. Um, again, one other interesting um, way that they will be used in the future will also be in exposures. So like Tamiflu for influenza, if somebody in a nursing home has uh, influenza, you can give the other people exposed uh, Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. Similarly, what's being studied is if somebody has COVID, you can give the household or the people in the congregate setting uh, these medicines to prevent them from even getting it in the first place. So, I'll give a bonus question, which is about masks. So we, we've learned a lot about uh, Omicron. Again, remember it's very light, it lingers in the air. So if you're going to be in a specific high risk setting for a long period of time, uh, wearing an N95 mask is really the, only, the way to go about doing it. In fact, many hospitals have changed guidelines with the age of Omicron to have the healthcare providers wear N95s if they're seeing patients. Um, at UCSF, we just changed that um, actually starting yesterday as a guideline. Um, and that, you know, if, if the patient and the provider, this is old data uh, really before Omicron and really not speaking to host factors, which is including vaccination. So it looks worse than it probably is. But to prevent uh, infection, uh, you can have maybe up to 2,500 hours of protection if you wear an N95 mask and the patient is also protected as opposed to a surgical mask, cloth mask, and wearing nothing, and you're wearing an N95. Um, so how do I put this in real life? Seeing a patient or you're seeing for a long time in a high-risk area, N95 or KN95 or some of these 
uh, masks that help prevent uh, well-fitted, but also help prevent these small fine aerosols from getting into you. If you're going out and about uh, for general use, I mean, I like the surgical mask. In general, I'm just going in the store for a short time, uh, but it's well-fitted. So some people might need to tie the knot to make it more well-fitted. Um, the in-between approach is wearing a double mask, which is a, a surgical mask and a cloth mask over it. Uh, and then finally, uh, the cloth masks don't really provide a lot of protection against Omicron infection, um, but any mask is better than no mask. So that's the way to think about it. Um, there's also finally some questions about the efficacy of the rapid testing against Omicron. But my feeling is, things haven't really changed. Um, it's There's probably a delay mainly because Omicron is so fast that you check your test if you do it too early or in after exposure, it's going to be negative. Remember, Omicron is being produced like crazy in the big airways. So it probably takes some time to go up to the nose. And maybe that's why we're not seeing a lot of loss of smell because it's, you know, it's really starting down there. So swabbing your nose will eventually pick it up. Um, and that's why initially uh, it's looking like the, the nasal swabs aren't uh, falsely negative, but they eventually turn positive. So most people I, you know, should wait to check it with a rapid test. And if you really think you have Omicron, confirm it with a PCR. Of course, PCRs are taking a while to come back, but so rapid tests still have a big um, part to play. Some people are, you know, figuring out whether or not combining a nasal and a throat swab will give increased sensitivity, but these are some of the questions we still have. So um, it seems that we're in a never ending loop of Omicron and COVID, but hopefully uh, we could uh, have some silver linings and, and, and maybe we're getting to a place where the virus is getting uh, weaker and weaker. That's what happened with the 1918 influenza pandemic. The population got a more immune there were no vaccines then because they all got infected. And then uh, the virus is also getting weaker. And then um, we can talk about this too, but it's really hard to think about giving boosters over and over again. Um, and maybe we should think about other ways of preventing infection or maybe giving boosters to certain, part, certain populations, maybe healthcare workers, uh, nursing home residents, the elderly at certain times of the year when there's a big surge coming even though three will probably protect you against uh, severe disease, getting an infection uh, in healthcare workers or in uh, some people may mean, mean a big deal because they will be taken out of the workforce. So maybe that's the way it's evolving. Uh, Israel, other countries, um, I think some, Chile maybe might be thinking about, Israel's already started, Chile and other countries may be thinking about for those. One of the senators from West Virginia uh, yesterday one it was advocating for four dose but again it seems really hard to over vaccinate some people and then not vaccinate others uh it's like a lopsided seesaw so it's it's kind of a works in progress so that's kind of um what i wanted to say formally and then we can uh, open it up to questions thank you so much peter this was excellent uh, like always you have made this topic so simplified and easy to understand for everyone so we really appreciate this, you know, and um, I was checking yesterday, close to 150 countries have Omicron variant right now, and they're facing the, the doubling time and the vertical curve, curve. So this is the perfect timing for your talk, as many countries are preparing for the Omicron surge right now. Um, uh, the uh, Multiple questions on reinfection, uh, Peter. So the questions have been like, if they, uh, people have uh, got two boosters, uh, can they still get infected with the uh, Omicron virus? So if people have gotten one boost, so we kind of have a general sense of, of the efficacy of infection, which is not 100%, but it's maybe 80 something, but maybe that's, it, you know, it all depends on context. Um, so that's the kind of average. If you get a, another boost on top of that, like Israel, we don't have data yet, but what the Israelis show is that in the initial studies, getting a fourth dose um, kind of gives you five times more antibodies, but we don't really know what that means. And that's expected. Um, maybe a future model could be, we settle at three um, at some point, just like many other vaccines. And then we know it's, you're going to be protected against the hospital for a long time. And then um, 
maybe we see a big surge coming to uh, some country. And then so for some people, you might boost them, not to protect them against severe disease, which might be protected from the regular three, but maybe you don't want them to even get infected. So maybe people who are essential in, in the workforce will get that, but seasonally. Um, but who knows? Uh, it, you know, we have the science, but we also have the ways that society interprets the science based on their needs. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. But in terms of natural infection, we know that, again, like I mentioned, if you got Delta, it's not very well uh, protective against Omicron. Um, and as South Africa con convincingly showed, and, and anecdotally in the US, uh, we know lots of people, like I, I talked to somebody yesterday who got Delta and then he got Omicron again, um, just most recently, even though he was vaccinated. Right, right. I think because of the mutations and the spike protein, as you described, um, there was a question about Israel. Why are they doing the fourth, uh, you know, a booster? Yeah. I think you've already, you've already talked about it. So I think we won't go into details of that. Um, and I think due to the mutations adjacent to the S1, S2 cleavage site, we know because there's more infectivity. And as you said, it's four to five times more transmissible than, than Delta. There are questions about boosters. So uh, if there's a cho choice between the mRNA, getting a Moderna or a Pfizer booster, uh, should one be preferred over the other? So right now the data is that Moderna lasts just a little bit longer, but it's not people are, want, you know, there are two possible explanations for that. They are very much the same vaccine, but Moderna was initially given in the one, two as a higher dose per se than Pfizer. But probably the most important thing for the beginning was that Moderna was given four weeks apart and Pfizer was given three weeks apart. And it's the length of time between doses that seems to result in a more robust immune long-term response. So, you know, right now in the US, it's kind of a weird rule where you can get a Pfizer boost and not five months instead of six months. There's no science about when to exactly get it, but you can get it anytime a few months after. In the UK, they're saying, if you got it three months ago, we'll give you a boost at three months. So it's really an example of how society interprets the science. In the UK, they said, we want to boost everybody as soon as possible. So if you got it three months ago, we'll take that. And that's because they were being, um, you know, assaulted by Omicron. They wanted to just boost up everybody in the society very, very quickly. The U.S. said, we'll look, look at the same data and we'll just give everyone at five day, five months for Pfizer, six months for Moderna. Same science, different interpretation. Uh, so coming back to original question, they're pretty much the same, but uh, Moderna just has a little bit more of a durable response. And they're both um, preferred from the U.S. Um, uh, CDC against uh, uh, adenovirus vector vaccine like J&J. Not they, you know, if you only had j, &J it's still like better or any other vaccine like Sinopharm, Sinovac, uh, Sputnik V, et cetera, they're still going to be better than no vaccine. But if you had a choice, uh, mRNA is just seems to be giving you the, the best benefit in terms of the most seri serious disease. Right. And uh, there's a question that if they have received a booster, and they are five months out from the booster. Is there waning immunity from the booster itself? Yeah, so we've seen, so this is what's happening and this is why it's frustrating. The immunity, <clears throat> well, there isn't as much data about uh, the booster immunity except in a few places. But what we see is the antibodies decline no matter when you get the shot um, at around four months, three to four months. So, um, you know, to keep the antibodies up, you kind of have to get a shot like every three or four months, which is, is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So some people thought, well, you know, maybe we will develop a nasal vaccine that will be kind of like an ointment and that will help, you know, locally prevent infection. Some people thought, well, maybe we'll just in the future give some populations the vaccine, but only in periods of surges. Um, but it, it seems that Israel is just jumping on it. And, you know, it's hard to like run around uh, because antibodies will decline every three to four months. And that's the first line of defense. That's getting the enemy in the front gate. But the T cells and B cells will stay intact for years and years. So that's the way it goes. It's like, how do you interpret it? How can you sustain giving the entire population uh, 
a vaccine every few months if you want to keep the antibodies high. Right, right. Um, uh, regarding mixing the vac vaccines, if they have received two doses of Pfizer, you know, uh, having a Moderna booster, would that be, a, because I think there was some data about that, you know? Yeah, there's no, um, there's no um, harm in mixing matching between Pfizer and Moderna or even any vaccine really. The UK was really great at showing the initial data showing that when they mix and match Pfizer and AstraZeneca, everything was fine um, because they were just doing things in the beginning when they're ruling out vaccines very, uh, they wanted to just vaccinate as many people as possible and didn't want to have barriers. So they just mix and match and also increase the interval uh, and everything seemed okay. In the, in the US, the NIH did a small study mixing and matching J&J, &J, Pfizer and Moderna. And, um, you know, it, it, everybody gets a high level of antibodies. Probably the biggest antibody was when you got, uh, <clears throat> when you had antibody changes, when you mix and match an mRNA and a, with an mRNA or mRNA and JNJ, but JNJ followed by JNJ was only like four times much, but we don't really know what that means for serious disease. So many of the countries where we work only have JNJ vaccine, they don't have access to mRNA vaccine. Mm -hmm. So what kind of booster plan would you recommend for JNJ? So for JNJ, there's data about uh, two doses of JNJ at least two months apart, which brings me to an original, so, and which will provide pretty good uh, protection. So JNJ is interesting because what their data shows is that you don't decline with antibodies as much. So it might be something where it kind of, you get a little bit more protection for what it's worth for longer because of that. So at least two months, you got your first JNJ, you, you can get a booster. Many people think that JNJ should have been a two dose vaccine anyway, to begin with, like AstraZeneca, it's the same thing. So personally speaking, if you have capacity and you can get a third, that will be great. I think three is going to be the magic number. But most guidelines are just if you got it once, wait two months, get it again, and that will carry you through. But um, again, it's the balance between resources and the optimal state. Or maybe at some point when we have more, you can get a third or maybe people recommend that. And people in U.S. who have access to mRNA, if they have got J&J, &J, they get a booster, preferably of mRNA. And do they need to get one more booster, like two boosters of mRNA, or just one booster would be sufficient? So in the U.S., if you got J&J &J first, the guidance officially is really to get an mRNA after two months. Right. <clears throat> but again, unofficially, if you think about J&J &J as really being two, then you should really get a third. But nobody's recommending that now. Maybe at some point they will, but I see that potentially as a future recommendation. There's no science around it yet. Right, right. right. Uh, a lot of confusion about the CDC guidelines, Peter, about the quarantine, like if a patient tests positive for COVID, you know, you know, how much should they quarantine five days, seven days, 10 days? And, you know, when should they end the quarantine, you know? So I'll simplify it. So let's say somebody has COVID and they're isolating. If you don't have access to any tests, at 10 days, you don't even need a test. Everybody could be free. Um, and the way I think about it is if you have access to tests, this is the safest way, and I'll come to the CDC in a bit. If you have a test, and we think that the most infectious time is two days before symptoms, three days after, but some people have no symptoms. But if you do have symptoms, that's kind of the most important time. So for that period of time, and plus the two days of cushion, three days, five days after symptoms, you, you isolate yourself, you keep yourself away from the world. After that, um, you know, that's where the controversy comes. So the safest thing to do after the five days is to get access to tests and tests to see if you're positive, particularly if you're a healthcare worker, uh, we're worried that you would expose patients, although different countries are dealing with that in different ways. Again, same science, different interpretation based on the country needs. So in a pre-Omicron study, about 13% of people at day five still have transmissible virus. So the CDC thought, well, CDC says they have data with Omicron that which it shows that it's even shorter. And most people, again, will not even have detectable virus at day five, but they haven't shared that. It's not pre-reviewed. Anyway, so 13% might be infectious at day five. The CDC says, well, maybe if you wear a mask, lots of people vaccinated, 
that will take care of the rest. Um, but the way to think about it is don't think about it as five or 10, but think of it as continuous. So maybe you have an access to test at day seven and you're fed up of being in isolation for the whole 10 days. And if you're negative, wear the mask for the rest of the time, but you can like go out and about. If it's day eight, two days saving is great. California changed their guidance to require tests. CDC still saying it's optional, but that's the science is the same. You're still most infectious for the vast majority of people two days before, three days after. So if you wait for five days, that's taking care of a, a big chunk of people. In healthcare, we're going to be more conservative and uh, require tests uh, before you go back to see patients. So that's the way to think about it. No tests, 10 days will take care of almost 100% of people. You just get, and most of the people, like close to 90% is within the five days. And then the little bit of the tail is in those five days and you can, the five additional days and you can test to feel better about it. Right, and the testing is the home antigen test or the PCR testing to end the quarantine? So that's controversial, but uh, from the California guidance, you can use any test. The problem with the earlier data is we know that when you use PCR, it's so sensitive and you can be picking up virus that says positive, but they are just RNA fragments and not live virus because we don't culture it to make sure they are alive. So that's the problem. And that was one of the reasons the CDC said why we didn't want to say people had to test because you may get a false positive and then you would stay, you know, continue when you don't really have viable virus. So in a sense, the rapid test might actually be more realistic because it's telling you um, that you are transmissible, you know, less sensitive, but more, you know, more real world. So if a rapid test is negative at day five, when I know that more like 90% of people are not are beyond that period of transmission, that will help me sort of like uh, even more uh, because I'm not using it for diagnosis. You already have diagnosis. I'm just using it for transmissibility. Um, but in the hospital, I think they may, they're probably going to be more, they're ruling it out now at, at least in our hospital, they're going to be a little bit more conservative. They're trying to get rapid tests, but um but right. that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, Peter, it's good to test twice with the rapid test, right? Times two? Yeah, well, for diagnosis, it's good to test twice. But for just transmissibility, this, the California just says you need it once. Uh, but, if, but if you want to do it twice, it's going to give you better confidence. So that's kind of where we are. And just to give you what other countries are doing just with the same science, Quebec says if we get a surge, that's overwhelming, even worse. We will say no isolation for healthcare workers. You just come and wear your mask and deal with it. South Africa says, we have so many people with Omicron now and it's going down. So you don't even have to isolate, just wear your mask for 10 days. And also lots of people have Omicron, they're not even diagnosed and they're just walking around. So, and containment hasn't really worked for Omicron. So you just walk around with your mask. So different countries, different UK, seven days, do a test. If it's negative, come back. So same science, different interpretation. Right. Uh, questions about children and, uh, uh, you know, Omicron. I think the data is concerning. When I was talking to South African colleague, colleagues, this, this uh, saw increase in hospitalization in children. A similar data from New York. Uh, we have a presentation coming up in two weeks later. But how do we uh, protect the children from the Omicron variant? So you want to build a wall of immunity around the children to vaccinate everyone around them. Uh, we're lucky in the U.S. that we can vaccinate kids over five. That's not true in many countries yet, uh, but that's been the strategy. Um, and vaccinating adolescents and definitely vaccinating the adults in their lives. So that that is a given. Um, there was an interesting study showing that even though young adults bring the virus into the household, the kids the babies are the ones that transmit it to people in the household because everyone's over the kid, even mm -hmm. though the kids don't get really sick. Um, people are going, there is definitely an increase in hospitalizations in kids, on, on, especially under five. Um, and overall in all peds, you'll examine that more detail. People are still um, mixed about whether or not it's very severe disease. Uh, we don't think so. They're not really dying more, luckily but they're still using hospital resources and it's still causing a lot of anguish in people when they are hospitalized. Also it's respiratory virus season. So 
there's a phenomenon of coming in for something else and getting COVID tested because everybody has it. So whether or not, uh, how, what, what proportion is what, uh, you know, I think is still really being worked up. Um, the other issue with kids is that they're presenting very differently. And you'll go into that in a bit in under five. Um, they seem to be, because most of the action is upper airways, big airways, but the kids' airway is very small. So with a little bit of mucus production, it's almost like power, you know, power influenza causing croup-like symptoms. So see like bark, that's bringing people into hospital. And then because that upper airway is clogged, there's a higher chance for bronchiolitis. So the smaller airway is being inflamed and that leads to wheezing and all of that too. So I think, you know, very different and nuanced uh, infection because of all of that stuff happening and mucus production uh, in the kids. Right. And there's a question from New Mexico about the risk, ben risk versus benefit in a well child with no comorbidities to get vaccinated and indications for COVID vaccinations in children, you know? Yeah. So um, I think the thing that, so first of all, kids under uh, 12 now, remember you are getting one third the dose. And, um, and so in the trials, sure, it's not a lot of people, may, a few thousand there were actually fewer side effects compared to the adult population getting 30 micrograms. The kids are getting 10 for each dose under 12. Um, and the outcome everyone's worried about is myocarditis. But myocarditis is very linked to adolescence and puberty and testosterone production. So it's really peaking in uh, ad late adolescence. So like 17 to 20 males. So when you go to kids, lower dose, not puberty, most cases, low amounts of testosterone. We haven't really been seeing any myocarditis, maybe two cases, I think convincingly since the pediatric vaccine rollout in US and all of them recovered. So that's the thing about the risk. Um, and then in the under fives, the six month to five year old trial was completed, but they used an even smaller dose, which was three. So 10 kids above that, 10 adults, 30, they used three and they found that it wasn't good enough. So they, instead of increasing those, what they decided to do is to give a third dose. So we're waiting for that trial. And that's the way probably things will settle. It will be a three dose series. Um, and, and then the six months to two years with two doses, uh, it actually looked pretty good, but they're probably just waiting for to chunk all of those things together. Do you know the timeline for the less than five? Because I think people, a lot of people are waiting. People are saying early spring. Um, okay. So maybe in... Uh, two months. Okay, okay. Uh, there's a question about wearing masks outside. Is it really necessary if you're not in close proximity to anyone? I would say it's all about context. So if you are like in a crowded outdoor area uh, with a lot of people close, like watching fireworks and things like that, I think that's what people are thinking. It's probably very unlikely, but I think just to be safe, uh, wearing a mask is good. And, and the surgical is really the baseline. But if you're like in a very uncrowded area, outdoors is at least traditionally speaking, 20 times less risky than indoors from the evidence. Um, and you can wear, I mean, if you're the only one and you're in San Francisco and there's wind all over the place all the time, you don't worry about it so much. Like I don't really worry about it so much, um, especially if it's not that crowded, but in a crowded uh, outdoor market, people really close to you, uh, you might want to be just safe, but there, there isn't very convincing evidence that even with Omicron is really uh, spread a lot outdoors. Right. And that should people avoid getting together in indoor spaces or going to restaurants for the next three weeks until we have the surge? Yeah. So I think I'm not that comfortable with indoor restaurants right now, but it will end pretty soon. Hopefully right now, I would say in San Francisco, UCSF, our positivity rate has plateaued, which is a good sign because test positivity rate comes before cases and cases come before hospitalizations and hospitalizations come before that. So we're seeing some flattening right now, which makes sense because New Year's happened, you know, about a little over a week ago. So that's kind of when this, we're picking up the end of the holiday surge with Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. This is kind of the right time. And we're whole crossing our fingers that this is it. So coming back to your question, I'm sure I'll feel comfortable by the end of the month with indoor, outdoor dining, I'm fine with doing everything else. I'm fine with uh, gatherings. You know, you have to, smaller is better. Um, but even vaccination, like I 
told you it's not 100% protection against Omicron. So maybe using it, if it's a small group and you have access to rapid testing, that probably will make me feel the most safe. But again, everything isn't 100%. You kind of have to layer protection on each other. How do you, uh, like people who are planning just to meet, you know, a grandparent or, a, you know, a member of the family, how do you strategize and plan it? Like, I guess just through the rapid test before the meeting or what is yeah. how you to go about it? Yeah. You know? So the point, the problem is the PCRs are taking so long to come back now. It makes no sense because you could have gotten a PCR three days ago, negative, but then even by just going to a meeting or something, you got Omicron. And then you would have been incubating. Again, it's probably very fast up and then for incubation, three days for Omicron, four days for Delta, five days for Alpha. That's the way people think about from the time you're exposed to when you start getting uh, infection. So very fast with Delta, with Omicron. So you can get in that period by the time you get the PCR. So even though more sensitive with the testing capacity now, it's, it probably is not as good. So maybe doing that, Rapid test just before you go in would be the best measure together with boosting. Uh, and if you're with a grandparent and they're high risk and maybe they, they are uh, immune compromised and you're not really sure they have response, you might want to be safe, have ventilation, wearing the mask maybe. Uh, but, you know, it just depends on the context. For a grandparent who's boosted, you are boosted, you did a rapid test, it's probably going to be okay. Okay, great. Uh, some questions from our YouTube audiences. Uh, what is the approximate incubation period time range for Omicron? I think you said somewhere around three days. Yeah, right? three days is thought. It's, a lot of this is based on, um, we don't have a lot of data because it's moving so fast, but it's, there's a big outbreak in, in Norway in this um, uh, wedding, I think, right. uh, where scores of people got infected. So a lot of data comes from that event with the three days. So. Right. It was a Christmas party, I think. And yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. And then another question from YouTube. Uh, is there an Omicron uh, booster in pipeline, which you're aware of, you know, which, which, which is going to be coming up? I think they, they made, a, they have a technology to do it and they've tried it in the lab in a small scale, but it, there's no plans really to bring out a designer booster. Plus Omicron would have gone already by you know by making a specific omicron booster maybe one other one other scenario is omicron is going to stay because it's so transmissible i can imagine like a more transmissible pathogen but maybe it will mutate to that but anyway it will stay and we our antibodies will wane and then you'll get <clears throat> reinfected with omicron but with a boosted or vaccinated you probably still be protected against severe disease it's just that you'll still get like a cold every few months if it sticks around right, right and you don't get a booster so right and uh, peter when i was talking to the south african colleagues a few months back you know they talked about decoupling of the number of cases and hospitalizations and death and i think you mentioned you're kind of seeing a similar scenario in the bay area which is good and there were some studies which pointed that the chances of ards and lung invasiveness is lower with omicron based on different animal models from different countries are you seeing patients with ARDS and Omicron variant uh, in the Bay Area? We're seeing a few patients, but it's the reverse. So if you look at the South African data, it's really interesting because of the people coming into the hospital, it's the flip of the old times. So in the old days, 70% of people were in the ICU and on ventilators, 30% on the floor. Now it was in South Africa, 70% on the floor, 30% in ICU or less. And then, of, and then they stayed for shorter time. So average time was three days, uh, versus like seven or eight days in the old days. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Less critically ill people, a lot of people just coming in for a shorter period of time with Omicron. But the point is we're still, and I would say more than 90% are unvaccinated. That's right. That's right. A question from uh, YouTube regarding the if if there are some respiratory symptoms and you do a rapid test and is it and if it's negative, do you trust it? Or do you still go for PCR before, you know? That's a great question. If if somebody has respiratory symptoms and I use a rapid test, I wouldn't stop there. Given the there was a study, um, you know, a small study of thirty people showing that you know there was a delay in pick, the rapid test picking up true disease, but eventually it'll pick it up. That's why you know Bavia mentioning, you know, the Binax rapid test comes in two swabs, not because you want to get 
two for the price of one is mainly because it's best used over a few days for good, uh, increased sensitivity. Um, but uh, the best thing to do is rapid is negative. You're still suspicious. Do a PCR. Right. Alternatively, a lot some people have been getting false positives for the rapid. So a lot of anecdotes of that. So rapid positive and you didn't do anything and you always home do a PCR, uh, but keep your mask on just to be sure. Right. Right, right. Some questions about treatment from YouTube. Uh, I think you already mentioned mutations in RBD and NTD, so the monoclonal antibodies are not effective. I think Paxlovid, as you mentioned, is you know is effective and it's like a golden drug right now. There are a lot of shortages of Paxlovid. So uh, how is the hospital dealing with you know choosing which patients to treat and which not? You know. That's a great question. So we're doing it by <clears throat> run. You know the highest level. So they stratify the highest risk patients of progression and that's how they, and they are kind of sitting in the hospital now. I think eventually it'll be more democratic because the U S is pre bought. Now they went from 10 million to 20 million doses. Um, but right now it's super scarce. Like you can't even get it for anybody and you only can get it as an odd patient. So if somebody comes in the inpatient and they're mild, you kind of have to, because that's the way EU is written. You have to discharge them and then they go have to pick it up at a pharmacy, but it's only, uh, it's very, very little, but it's gonna ramp up by the end of this, this month. Um, for monoclonal antibodies, there's only one that works, so Trovimab, and that's really, really in short supply. Um, and it's done by randomization of the people who wanna go on a list in by institution. So it's, nobody can get it really. Okay. And uh, any research on uh, convalescent plasma against Omicron, you know, the effectiveness? Oh, that's a great question. So convalescent plasma is people who had COVID and they donate their plasma. So in the old days, well, in the old days, it was the only thing we had. So we use it. Then monoclonal antibodies came and we started to use that. And now monoclonal antibodies, most of them are not effective, but so... I actually personally started using convalescent plasma for severely ill people yesterday, because if you think about it, many people have Omicron now, so their donated plasma actually has Omicron antibodies in it, depending on when you get that convalescent plasma product. So eventually become more and more uh, effective. The data isn't great for convalescent plasma in general, but for some people, it probably will be useful, like people who didn't develop antibodies or unvaccinated people who are in, in, in the inpatient setting. Right. I think we have just have two minutes, uh, Peter. So I think I'll end with this question. Most of the people around the world right now are relying on home management of Omicron, uh, you know. And um, so, you know, what do you advise to people who are who have mild symptoms, who are managing on their own? What are the danger signs which they should watch watch for when they have to immediately go to the hospital, uh, to the ER? Should they get a pulse oximeter just to monitor? And are there any home treatments like, you know, uh, you know, uh, just oral steroids or something, uh, which pe which people can take. So, uh, how do they navigate the? Uh, and many of the places where we work do not have access to uh, hospitals close by. So, I think the home management is the big question for them. You know. Yes. Yeah, so, home management is all about symptom management and taking care of your symptoms. Are not they're not going to affect your general course. So, you know, with Omicron all the same ways you treat a cold. It is a coronavirus after all, by making yourself more comfortable. Um, danger signs, so the decongestants, the pain for the muscle, you know, Panadol or, or paracetamol or ibuprofen for the muscle aches. Um, for severe disease, if you're at risk for getting severe disease and you have access to pulse oximeter, it's really the best thing. Uh, or if you don't, then maybe try to walk up a flight of stairs every day and see if you're getting, changing your symptoms. And, 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 and that will be the sign. Uh, there's still Delta in many parts of the world too. So loss of taste and smell. So like you wake up in the morning, see if you have a fever, try to smell your coffee and, um, you know, try to drink your coffee and see if you taste it. And if you can't do that, that, that is also a symptom for, you know, Delta and the other variants, which are still circulating. Right, right. Okay, that's great. For the pulse oximeter, do you suggest like a cutoff of 92 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, 92, 93, 92. 
Okay, that sounds good. Uh, I think uh, we, sh we should just call it. I think there were a few more questions which were not answered, but I can email those to you. But thank you so much uh, for doing this excellent talk and a really informative Q&A session. This was really helpful and we really appreciate this. And thank you everyone for joining today. Hope everyone stays safe and uh, please take care. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks, thank everyone. you.